Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And I'm Carly Bird. Week 70. Week 70. <gasps> we did it, guys. We hit the we big have, 7 We did. I didn't we, realize until we just said it now. So anyway, we got a fun episode, and let's just kind of get into it today. Um, for Scary Thing in the News, we have, honestly, I feel like I'm more excited about the Scary Thing in the News. You always are. Than I actually am about anything else that we're talking about. Scary Thing in the News really society and humans in general but we're going to kind of get into it where a uh, about two weeks ago a i was thinking about sharing the post but it's a little graphic so i got i got mm -hmm. the thread pulled up here that we can look at mm -hmm. um that's a little bit better well well i say better but anyway uh, a woman, an 80, an 80 plus year old woman was actually killed in South Carolina. Um, she was walking her dog and the dog, she got in between her and the dog to protect the dog. Um, the dog did have some injuries, but the dog did live, but she actually ended up getting drugged into the pond and she was murdered or, or killed by it. Um, and then the people came in to relocate the alligator. So anyway, I, I saw this story because I think Joe Rogan even talked about it too. Uh, he talked about this story and he talked about this other one. And I went really down this rabbit hole. And I was fascinated by this because this ties into a couple of things, Carly, that we've actually d dealt with, which is something that your, you know, your dream boy talks about all the time, Jeremy Clarkson. Um, they have an issue in England with badgers, badgers and that it's illegal to kill badgers. Yeah, they're not they're, allowed to. Yeah, tell, tell them about that. Well, it's kind of like here, like um, uh, bald eagles, you know, you're not allowed to kill these type of species because at one point in time in England, badgers were endangered species. They were about to go extinct. So they were like, let's just set this up so that the badgers will survive no matter what. So they set these laws up to protect the badgers. And now Great Britain is like overrun with badgers, according to my favorite TV show, Clarkson's Farm um they are overrun and the problem with badgers is that they kill you know chickens and they also spread diseases across livestock and if your cow gets sick they have to like put the cow down because the badger drank out of the same water trough like it's just that simple the badger runs across the farm poops and the cow like sniffs it and like automatically gets whatever diseases the badger was carrying but they're not allowed to kill the badgers Anyway. And, and so anyway, um, with that said, which which is some good information that gets into like this. Possums here. Yeah, possums. Got, they're not they're not like right. an endangered species. Right. And what's what's interesting about this whole thing when I went down this rabbit hole is the government oversight that happens where you 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 do something that maybe at the time was a good thing, but things have to be adjusted like now. Exactly. And with the possum or your badgers, that's the thing, and with the alligators. So this woman tragically died, and I didn't realize like there is a lot of deaths and attacks that happen by by alligators and humans hmm. and i was trying to like look into it a little bit more like well what does all this mean it's like well can you defend yourself um and that kind of got into an interesting rabbit hole that i kind of want to show everyone today where you actually um in florida it is a third degree felony under florida law to kill or injure an alligator it is also a felony to capture or, or whatever an alligator so there's a third degree felony to attack one then i thought like well what happens if you get a, you're getting attacked right now right, right well uh under the guideline of the florida state statute including two, 2022 special s sessions a and b a person may not intentionally kill injure possess or capture kill or possess an alligator or crocodilian period okay so if you are being attacked by an alligator you cannot actually legally defend yourself where does it say that R literally right there so i will read it again for the carly first night with tequila it guys says a person may not intentionally kill like like if it was not they were not provoked is the way i read that I mean, we could get a lawyer in here next to kind of do it. A person who violates this section commits a level four felony violated under Action 373. So, level four. yeah. So the point is, we can, I'd love to have somebody on the show to talk about this, but they are very stringent about like, you cannot proactively go out there. You have to actually get somebody in there to deal with the creature. Um, the alligator in question that actually killed that woman, they didn't euthanize it. They just relocated it. Wow. So I just thought that was very interesting. And then I was like, oh, it's pretty much endangered, right? Like there's probably issues with that. Well, uh, there's an estimated 5 million American alligators that are spread out across the Southeast United States. Roughly 1.25 million alligators live in the state of Florida alone. Wow. Clearly, they're not an endangered species anymore. No. 
They're very abundant. And I just showed Carly a very gruesome video before we got started today oh my goodness, that's awful. of a dog being attacked by one of these things. And I guess my whole point is it's very interesting about these laws and stuff where, okay, maybe in the 60s, like there was probably an issue with this, but now it's changed a little bit. Right. And then I just want to get into, and there's two parts of this thing. And we're going to talk about the government side of this, and this is why it makes it scary, but then also the people. And this kind of gets us into the next part of the scary thing in the news, which is people's reactions to this poor woman being attacked by this thing. Oh, my gosh. Um, what are they saying? And Jack, you, know what? you got her. I'm going to be showing that to you right now. Let me get this thing rearranged because my computer is being a piece of shit. Um, P-O-S? M-S-T-S-N. Thank you so much. Hang on. Hmm? T-S-M? What's that mean? No idea what you're talking about. Here it is. <laughs> you think I drank too much. All righty. So basically right here, this is the comment thread under that woman being uh, that woman being attacked. Um, what? Right. I hope you're right and they don't punish the gator for someone else's ignorance. Imagine if the animal world would euthanize the human who harmed or killed an animal by the rate we we seem to smarten up about our issues we humans would probably be long gone it really illustrates how strong oh, let's go no, no there's some other ones let me get to another one cat's scratch is more prone I, I can read it. Uh, America, where a girl, a girl bitten in the leg by an alligator opts for self-transport to the hospital, you know, wherever you took it like. Um, it, again, like it, it's comments like this, which is amazing. And, and then I found some other ones, but then I, again, it just got blocked, I guess. I don't know where it is. Um, I'll edit this part out because this is actually trash. But anyway, um, what is a miracle, what is just amazing to me, let me get this back up here. Perfect. Oh no. Where's my mouse? So anyway, that's just really what was amazing to me is the fact that there are a ton of people online that are really kind of just saying like it was the person's fault, blah, blah, blah. They shouldn't be in their backyard doing this stuff. And it's like just substitute badger or gator with tiger or puma or something like that. And it's the fact how little people care about people's lives anymore which is just fascinating to me that we've got to the society. And this is why the government probably has these like viewpoints of like, we can't take this thing off the endangered species list. And it's like, well, how many people need to get hurt before this change? And this is actually a big issue with another story that I'm actually working on now, which is a shark one, of course, where in Australia, the government has flat out said like, they think a animal's life is actually higher on the chain than a human's life. And that that means we lose two or three people at the beach every year extra. That's fine. If we can save the animals, and that is a very interesting viewpoint that you have where it's like you automatically do that. And that's just, it's not safe. And it's one thing if it's a badger or a bird. But when you're talking about a predator, like an alligator or a wolf or a coyote or a shark, what's the line? And the fact that you have 5 million gators. And the thing that really blew me for a loop is like I thought about actually maybe it would be really cool to live down there but now it's like if i'm out there walking and there's water everywhere down in florida guys it's right. everywhere and i know my wife she's extremely blonde and she could have a dog or something and she'll just walk down to the water without thinking about it oh, and because water is pretty yeah and there's dinosaurs in there now and the fact is that you one is they'll eat dogs because dogs are stupid and walk down towards them but the fact is that you're not allowed to defend yourself yeah that's kind of scary that's pretty terrifying mm -hmm. or if you have kids and then, like, and I was actually looking at this other article, which was about um, this little boy that got eaten oh. uh, in Disney World in their park where they had a beach. And he was in just in the park. Oh my God. Yeah, he was at the beach because, like, you know, Disney, there's a resort there and they have a resort on the lake. And so the kid was at the beach and just came up and slurped him. Oh. And people were upset at the parents for, like, leaving him unsupervised. And it's just like, to me, it's kind of like this other story I found. I have so many of these things that I found, but I don't have them linked here. Whereas this, this coyote jumped a fence to try to get a chicken and started to maul this like five-year-old girl that was in the backyard. Oh. And the coyote left. And people online were just trashing the parents. And it's like, it, it, it broke into your yard. Right. How like I, I don't understand like when can when are you allowed to blame the animal ever? And it's such a weird society that we live in now where you're never allowed. Like I get like 
I, I get some conservation, one hundred percent. People are just so quick to jump to conclusions too, and just bitch. They just they want to cast blame on the opposite thing that you think needs to be blamed. Like they're always trying to play devil's advocate mm-hmm. and disagree. Like people are constantly looking for a fight right now. It really is. It's just so bizarre. Where it's like. I don't know. Like, I don't understand this, whether it's just like this woman that like got it, that lost her life and like, okay, there's an animal issue. We probably should take care of this because again, it's not like you're in the backwoods somewhere. It's like, if this is just, you're strolling down your street and it was a golf pond. So it was in the middle of like one of those really brought up areas. This is a problem. Right. Right. And I really feel like if you just exchange the word alligator with a human or alligator with tiger, all of a sudden people's opinion would change. Like, you know, woman got killed by blank man who was in the area or woman got killed by tiger. Right. Then it wouldn't be the woman's fault at all. No, people would be like, like, whatever. Gosh, that man is absolutely but if it's, horrible. If it's a, yes. But if it's a certain animal, it's like, well, no, it's not that person's animal's fault. Right, right. And that's just not, I don't know. It's not conducive to society. Anyway, that's why I think what made this so scary in the news is what scares us and basically our reaction to when some tragedy oh, happens. I know, right? It is. But anyway, but now we're going to get to the second scariest thing. So for tonight's tale, we're going to be getting into something that's very interesting, which is about the whole sleep paralysis thing. Now, sleep paralysis has a lot of medical um, determinations and prognosis. Could be a lack of airflow. Could be something with your sleeping position that makes a chemical imbalance in the brain. Doctors and and medical professionals are pretty certain of, of the root cause of it. However, there's always this other aspect of well, what if it's not that easy? What if it's not just sleep paralysis? And why does your brain go there if it is sleep paralysis to this almost otherworldly area, this demonic world? Time now for the tale of my dreams. It was a typical autumn evening, the kind that makes you want to curl up under a blanket with a good book and a cup of hot cocoa. Sarah had just finished her dinner and was settling into bed, looking forward to a peaceful night's sleep. As she drifted off, she couldn't help but think about the strange dreams she'd been having lately. In these dreams, she was unable to move, trapped in her own body, as some unseen force held her down. It was a terrifying sensation, and one that left her feeling shaken even after she awoke. She tried to ignore it, chalked it up to stress or over overreactive imagination, but the dreams continued to plague her. As Sarah drifted off to sleep, she was unaware of the dark presence that had entered her room. It was a creature of pure malevolence or with an insidious nature, a demon from the realm of sleep that fed on fear It hovered over Sarah's sleeping form. It twisted features illuminated by the soft glow of the moon. Sarah's body went rigid, frozen in place as the demon settled on her chest. Its weight was suffocating and Sarah gasped for air as she struggled to move. But no matter how hard she tried, her limbs remained limp. The demon whispered a taunting, chilling laughter into the air revealing in the terror it was inducing. It knew that Sarah was helpless, that her mind was trapped in a prison of her own body. It could feed on her fear, drawing strength from her misery. Sarah's heart raced as she felt the demon's icy breath on her neck. It was as though a piece of the underworld had crept into her room, intent on destroying her. She tried to scream, but no sound could escape her lips. She was trapped, a victim of the demon's insidious power. The demon's grip tightened as she felt its hands almost crushing her chest and squeezing her throat. And Sarah felt a searing pain in her chest. It was as though something sharp had pierced her flesh and she cried out in agony, but no words escaped her lips. The demon crackled in delight feeding on her pain as though it was so scrumptious a feast. It felt like hours passed, though Sarah could not tell how long it was. Time had lost all meaning in the grips of this monster. She could feel it draining her of energy, sucking the life out of her agonizing moment by moment. 
Finally, as dawn approached, the demon released its hold on her. Sarah lay there, shaking and sweating, her mind reeling from the nightmare she had just endured. She knew that it was not a dream, that it had to be real. The next night, as Sarah prepared for bed, she felt a sense of dread wash over her. She knew that the demon would return, that she was powerless to stop it. She tried to calm herself down, to convince herself that it was all in her head, but the fear lingered. Sure enough, as soon as she drifted off to sleep, the demon was there, waiting for her. It was sitting there by the stoop of her bed, and she watched it pounce down like a cat. She sat there, terrified in fear, trying to move her body. She tried to wiggle her feet, wiggle her toes, wiggle her hands, but nothing would move. But she could still feel everything. She could feel the air moving in and out. She could hear a pin drop. There was no noise, but she could feel the tugging on the back of her blanket. She could feel it as it pulled tight against her toes, like something was crawling up the bed. Crick, crick, crick. Then she felt pressure on the tips of her toes, then the weight on her shins, and then her knees. But she couldn't look down towards it. Her face was frozen. Again, the demon laid perched right on her chest. The demon fed on her fear, drinking in her terror like a fine wine. Sarah felt her strength draining away again as though the demon was sucking the very life from her veins. But then something strange happened. As Sarah lay there, trapped and helpless, she began to feel a strange energy build within her. It was a spark of defiance, a glimmer of hope in the darkness. With every ounce of willpower she could muster, Sarah fought back against the demon. She focused all her energy on a single point, summoning a burst of pure energy that pushed the demon back. The demon flung off into the ceiling, turning into this, this swirling pit of darkness, and started to mutter in another language, Vlashne Niktu Vaninka, poof, before leaving. The next morning, Sarah woke up, and when her husband kissed her on the cheek, did you sleep well, dear? She muttered like, yeah, it was okay, not wanting to try to lead on to it. But then he stopped, pitch white, in the bathroom. Sarah, what happened last night? What are you talking about, Frank? Look in the mirror at your back, on the back side of her neck, were these claw marks on either side of her throat, just subtle, almost like a burnt. But you can ind indistinguishably tell that there were three fingerprints on each side of her neck. What happened? Did I do that to myself? Was I squeezing my throat last night? No, it couldn't be. I don't, my fingernails, I trimmed after I got back from the wedding. They're too long to be my hands. Frank, did you do this? I was passed out the whole night. And that was the tale of dreams. You've had sleep paralysis before, haven't you? I think we all have. You do? I don't know that I have. Have you never had sleep paralysis? I don't think so. I think my dreams are always, always extremely vivid. And I remember them a lot of the time when I wake up. And I like to, I like to honestly just daydream about my dreams. Like, and just like remember all of the things that my mind came up with. Even when they're like not, even when they're scary, I don't know about, I, I specifically, there's one specific dream that I like to think about on a regular basis just because of how crazy it was. Well, guys, listen, tonight was a little bit special being 70 episodes and the fact that we actually hit 200 subscribers tonight. Woo! And so we do have a second story. Prepare yourselves for the sleep paralysis demon. My sleep paralysis demon is actually a pretty chill guy. My first memory of sleep paralysis happened when I was 10 years old. 
I remember because it was the night my parents took me to see Shrek 2 for getting good marks on my report card. That's a good movie. It was an evening show, so we got in late and my mom tucked me straight into bed when we got home. It was around 4 a.m. when I woke up. The light from my alarm clock told me that much. I couldn't feel anything, but my pajamas against my skin or the warmth of my head against the pillow. I could feel my arms and legs, but they felt heavy, as if a great weight was holding them down. I tried to call out, but I couldn't. My voice caught in my throat, my lips unable to move. I mustered a weak groan that sounded like a cross between a frog's croak and a zombie's moan, but that was about it. I thought I was dead, that this is what it feels like to be dead. Being awake but unable to move or tell anyone? My mind wrestled with the idea of being placed in a coffin, unable to tell anyone I was still alive in there. Unable to move or say anything as the lid closed and they put me in the ground, still alive. My fear subsided as I felt my heart thudding in my chest in response to my near panic attack. I also became aware of my breathing, which slowed as the fear subsided. I calmed a little thinking it was just a dream. That was when I saw him for the first time, Mr. Brown Sticklegs. He huddled in the corner of the room by my closet. His two oversized red eyes glowed in the dark of my bedroom. His face was like a porcelain mask, white, expressionless, with no mouth or nose, only those two haunting red eyes eyes. When he stood up, his body unfolded like origami until his head reached the ceiling. His neck bent, tilting forward as his true height was greater than the height of the room. His long black torso was covered in shimmering symbols that reflected red in the light of his glowing eyes. He stood on two spindly thin legs that disappeared into the shadows of the room. He made no noise as he moved, seeming to glide as he hovered across my bed. His long, thin arms reached down to me as I moaned through paralyzed lips. I could not scream, even though I very much wanted to. His fingers reaching through the darkness down to my face. Two pointed fingers touched against my eyelids, pushing them closed. I remember his fingertips feeling cool but not cold. Even though the ends of his fingertips looked sharp, his touch was gentle. Do not struggle, little one. Sleep. Sleep, mm -mm. he said. His voice was so deep I could feel it in my chest when he spoke. I did as he instructed, convincing myself that it was indeed a dream. Even if it wasn't, the back of my eyelids was more reassuring than looking into those piercing red eyes and his vacant mask of a face. I closed my eyes, wanting it to be a dream, willing it to be a dream. I woke up the next morning, thankfully able to move, walk, and talk. I explained what I saw to my parents, who both agreed that it was a dream. My mom tried, floating the idea that something from Shrek 2 scared me but neither my dad or I bought it. For confirmation, dad asked what I draw, that I draw a picture of what I saw for them. As I was drawing, I ran out of black crayon and had to finish his legs with the next darkest color in my crayon box. Hey there, Mr. Brownstick Legs, my dad said as I handed him the drawing. You leave my daughter alone now, you hear? This is how my sleep paralysis demon ended up with the name Mr. Brown Sticklegs. Giving him a silly name helped take some of the edge off going to bed the following night. My dad even did a sweep of the room, calling out for him. Hey, Mr. Brown Sticklegs, he said, whistling as if he were calling a dog. It made me giggle, and the whole episode felt more fun than scary. But once they tucked me in and turned off the light, I felt the dread creeping back in. Darkness hits harder when you expect to find something lurking in the shadows. I don't know how long I searched, but I eventually fell asleep. In the weeks following, I searched for Mr. Brown Sticklegs every night as, he, as I fell asleep. Even when I went to sleepovers, I would do a cursory check, 
in case he tagged along to a friend's house. As time passed, my searches became less frequent. It was a couple months later, the night before my first day of fifth grade, when I woke up to Mr. Brown's stick legs straddled over my bed, his empty plate of a face inches from my own. A scream stuck in my throat, coming out sounding like a gush of air released from a pool float. Hush, child, he said. His voice nope. was deep, echoless. I didn't know how he spoke without a mouth, but I heard him nonetheless. I saw that he held a piece of paper in his thin fingers, crumpled on the edges and torn. He held it up to show me. On the, pa on the page was a pink blob with blue dots for eyes and a droll red smile and stick lines for legs and arms. It was lying on a blue rectangle. I found the picture you drew of me, so I drew a picture of you, he said. Do you like it? I tried nodding, but I couldn't move. Fuck hell. I tried answering, but all that came out was the same dry croaking sound. Will you draw another one for me? I so liked the first one draw. you gave me. I look good in pants. Again, Is his dick just waving out. I, know, I don't know. Again, I was unable to respond or move to give him an answer. He must have been able to read my intent because he tucked the picture under my pillow before closing my eyes again. When I woke up in the morning, I bolted upright and tossed my pillow off the bed. My heart leapt into my throat when I found the picture. It wasn't a dream, he was real. I went to my desk and began drawing a picture for him, starting with his face and his eyes, trying to capture as much detail as I possibly could remember. I had forgotten all about the first day of school until my mom opened the door and found me still in my pajamas. Lexi, she yelled, startling me as I was coloring his eyes. Your bus will be here in less than an hour. Get dressed. I tucked my picture into my school backpack and got dressed. I finished my drawing at recess that day using my brand new Crayola 64 pack that I got with my back to school supplies. I gave him blue pants this time, figuring he'd like to see himself in jeans. I wrote his name again, Mr. Brown Sticklings, at the bottom of the picture and drew a smiley face next to it, hoping he'd like his nickname. I flipped the paper over to write him a message on the back. I wanted to ask him questions, but didn't want to anger him since he visited me when I was at my most vulnerable. I wrote out my letter on a separate piece of paper before copying it over to the back of my picture. Dear Mr. Brown Sticklegs, that's your name. My name is Lexi. I'm in fifth grade. What is your name? How old are you? Do you go to school? Why do you visit my bedroom? Why can't I move when you visit? You look scary, but you also seem nice. I hope we can be friends. Love, Lexi. P.S. I hope you like your blue pants. I added another smiley face at the end of the letter, my final emphasis on wanting to be friends. I considered closing with sincerely, but figured love was better, a friendlier choice. I tucked the picture under my pillow that night, now anxious to see him rather than filled with dread of his reappearance. But like the last time, he did not return the next day or the day after. The days stretched into weeks, and every morning I found the picture tucked under my pillow from the night before. It wasn't until Thanksgiving break that I saw him again. My eyes opened as the morning sun poked through the blinds of my bedroom. His body didn't look any different in the light. In fact, his black skin seemed darker, absorbing the sun rays without giving anything back. His eyes seemed wider than before. If he had a mouth, I would have figured he was smiling. In his slender fingers was the picture I drew for him. Hello, Lexi, he said. Thank you for the picture. I do look good in blue pants. I wanted to smile, but, well, sleep paralysis. He flipped the picture over to the side with my letter. I will answer your questions the best I can. I do not have a name, not one you could ever pronounce. <laughs> But I'm happy for you to call me Mr. Brown Sticklegs. As for my age, I exist outside the construct of time. Therefore, I am ageless. 
I do not go to school, nor do I know what school is. Why do I visit you? I visit to feed on the energy of your soul. My breath quickened as a mute groan. Get the fuck out of there, kid. Jesus Christ. My, <laughs> through my teeth, I wanted to run. Wanted to get away from him, but I was pinned down, unable to move. He sensed my uneasiness and trying to calm me by patting my forehead. Let me explain. <laughs> Have you been to the ocean? It appears vast, almost limitless. As you stare into the blue water, with no visible land on the other side. In my mind, I was standing on a beach. I felt the salty ocean breeze against my face as I looked out over the massive body of water. The waves crashed at my feet. I felt the rush of water over them, followed by the trickle of sand and pebbles as the water drew back. Your soul is like an ocean, child. Vast. Limitless. Undefinable by words to your understanding. I take only a sip, a single glass of water from a vast ocean. I am not one who could consume an entire ocean. Dark clouds formed over the water as I stared at the white-capped waves. The clouds unleashed a heavy downpour, turning the horizon gray as rain fell from the sky over the ocean. Just as the rain falls over the ocean, your soul can replenish itself by more than I could ever consume, not even in a thousand of your years. Does that make you feel better? Mm. On the beach, in my mind's vision, I nodded. In my bedroom, he nodded back at me. Good. As for your last question, why you cannot move? We are meeting at a point outside of your time, where your world and mine touch. Your physical body cannot move here, but if you persist, you can learn to speak to me with your mind. I will answer your questions in exchange for your drawings. <laughs> you can draw pictures of whatever you like. I want to know more of your world. In my mind, I nodded again. This knowledge is a gift so we can understand one another more. I am not one who would hurt you. He pressed his fingertips to my eyelids again, closing them. In my mind's eye, I was still on the beach, but the sun was setting and no stars were visible through the rain. I drifted back to sleep to the sound of falling rain. The next morning, I asked my parents for a sketchbook and colored pencils. They tried to hold me off until Christmas, but since I spent most of my afternoons and weekends drawing pictures up in my room, Dad let me open one of my gifts a week early. A Strathmore sketchbook with 100 pages and a 50-pack of Crayola colored pencils. I started by drawing the rest of my family. Mom, Dad, my little brother, Tommy, our cat Libby, and even though he died, our dog Pancakes. Next, I drew our house, then our car, then my school. I kept drawing anything I could think of, trees, birds, insects, until my sketchbook was full. I used my allowance to purchase more books so I could keep drawing. I honed my craft, redoing my earlier drawings in greater detail. My thoughts considered his, my thoughts considered his wording. I am not one who could consume the entire ocean. I wanted to ask him if there were those who could but I wasn't sure if I wanted to know such things. Mr. Brown's stick legs didn't return until my freshman year of high school. To him, it wasn't like any time had passed. I read up on lucid dreams and the time between visits so that when he returned, I would be better capable of talking to him. He held my books in his hands, flipping through my drawings, doting over the increased re refinement of my drawings. I had filled a dozen sketch pads and upgraded from Crayola to Prismacolor Premier Pencils for my drawings. Good girl. His biggest surprise was when, after he complimented my drawings, I spoke to him. Thank you, I said. 
seeing the words in my mind as I spoke them aloud. If he had a surprised expression, his eyes showed it. You have been very busy, child, he said. Do you have any questions you would like to ask? I hesitated, but finally formed the words in my mind. Are there creatures who can consume an entire ocean? He didn't respond right away, which made me think I had not asked properly. As I asked him a second time, he put a finger to my lips, as if to shush me. There are those who can. They are known as the Dark Ones. They are capable of consuming entire souls, emptying them out, leaving them dry and barren. You should not fear them, but you should also not provoke them. His eyes curved downward as if concerned or afraid. What did they look like? I asked. In my mind, my visions were filled with images of great, terrible creatures, spiders taller than the Empire State Building on thin, spindly legs of shadows and smoke, tentacled monsters in the seas, lofting blue whales like they were toys, ripping them to shreds with their curved beaks, great, ghastly, flying creatures that knocked over orchards and forests with the beat of their leathery wings. I showed you only because you ask, Mr. Brown Sticklegs said. But it is best that we don't talk or think about them. Let them be. I nodded in my mind. He leaned forward and pressed his plate-like face to my head as if to kiss me on the forehead, which was odd since he didn't have a mouth. Then, as usual, he closed my eyes and I drifted back to sleep. My life took a downturn during the latter years of high school. My dad lost his job when the search for a new one dragged on. He turned to drinking to cope with his failure. He wasn't abusive, but he wasn't fun to be around either. In the months following, my parents would hush their arguing when I entered the room, greeting me with smiles as if nothing were wrong. That lasted until the day I came home from high school to them fighting over a foreclosure notice from the bank. We moved out over a weekend from our home we moved out over a weekend from our home in the suburbs to an apartment on the other side of town. I internalized my feelings during that time. I withdrew from my friends and school activities besides the art club, the only one we could still afford. I saw my friends driving to school and hanging out while I rode the bus, too f too poor and too far out of the way to join in. My tastes began to change as well. Out was the bubblegum pop of Carrie, Katy Perry, Kesha, and Taylor Swift. Instead, I listened to Pierce the Veil, Sleeping with Sirens, and Bring Me the Horizon. <laughs> Those are my fans. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Yeah. Stop it! <laughs> yeah, fuck Katy Perry. <laughs> Sleeping with, I was literally listening to Sleeping with the Sirens this morning while walking the dog. I'm not kidding. That is my van. Okay. <sighs> my clothes and makeup became darker. More black t-shirts and skirts with black eyeliner and black fingernail polish. Mom called it my goth phase. This not is, that she understood. This is Carly. It really is. My drawings became darker too. I moved from colored pencils to charcoal. Drawing skulls, gothic looking cemeteries as my passion for drawing animals and flowers waned. I also drew the dark ones in great detail, exactly how I remembered them in my mind's eye. Mr. Brown Sticklegs visited me again, a month after we moved into the apartment. He looked more at home in my room of black light posters and death metal bands than he did in my previous room. His eyes were dim, not the vibrant red eyes that they were before. He stared at me as I lay in bed, unable to move. He moved inches from my face as I heard his words in my mind. Your soul tastes different now. He didn't speak of my drawings. I worried that he might, especially since I'd been drawing the dark ones. Not only drawing them, but thinking about them, and what type of damage they could do if they were to wake. He seemed sad for me, although reading his expression was difficult with a no face. He patted my forehead like before, but didn't close my eyes before leaving as he used to. 
My life continued its spiraling path like a bottle rocket with a broken stick. My parents didn't talk outside of short conversations about which bills to pay and which ones to ignore. Each night, Dad disappeared into a bottle while Mom disappeared online to chat with a male Facebook friend she knew from high school. The thing about rock bottom is that it's often a disguise for a trap door that drops you to an even lower depth than you thought possible. The first bottom came when my father died. Drove off the road into a gravel pit late at night with an empty bottle of bourbon in the passenger seat. I cried, but it felt hollow. I felt hollow. Even when my mom tried to hold me, I felt nothing inside. Not sadness, not guilt, not anything. I disappeared into my sketchbooks. Drawings, even darker, more disturbing images. Death, dis dismemberment, vividly accurate, vivisections of cute animals I used to enjoy drawing. My friends no longer talked to me, which was fine because I didn't want to talk to them anymore anyways. I found people to hang out with, not friends, but people who could get me access to moments of chemical-induced euphoria to forget about life for a while. This is her upbringing. This is crazy. This is not my upbringing. <laughs> this just keeps spiraling and spiraling. I'm very sad for this person. As I take a little sip of my tequila. For her chemical. My chemical euphoria. Just like that, the trap door opened, dropping me to a new rock bottom of addiction. One thing I had that in common with my dad, but instead of falling into a bottle, I fell into a needle. Holy shit! I stole money from my mom's purse to feed my habits, not that she noticed. She was busy with her old Facebook friend who had moved from online acquaintance to nightly sleepover companion. When the time came to, to my senior year, I didn't bother going back. I kept drawing, filling entire sketchbooks with dark images that reflected my bleak outlook on life. Dark ones were prevalent subjects during this period of my life. I drew them feasting on humanity, raking flesh from bone and their jagged teeth behind lips of smoke. I came home one night to find my mom and her new male friend in the middle of a fight. It was different from her fights with dad, more violent, more physical. When she raised his hand, when he raised his hand at me for trying to intervene, I decided it was time to bolt. I left home hitching rides with anyone with a set of wheels I could manage to put up with for short periods of time. My preference leaned towards those with access to the chemical release I craved. The more I could numb, the more I could escape. I found certain drug combinations and similar effects to sleep paralysis, where my mind's ability to control my body's actions became severed. In those moments of numbing paralysis, I'd see Mr. Brown Sticklegs watching me from afar as I dulled the pain. I saw what I perceived as the dark ones too, but they weren't hiding in the shadows like Mr. Brown Sticklegs did. They were the shadows. I called out to them as well, for in those moments I wanted nothing more than to be hollowed out and empty, a void so dark no pain could ever penetrate it. When they didn't answer, I called out to Mr. Brown Sticklegs, but he would vanish every time. Perhaps it was all just a drug-fueled hallucination. Overdosing was never my intention. I was pushing too much, trying to find the, fi find the edge of void after seeing and feeling so low, searching for that something extra to filter out the background noise. I took it too far, giving myself a near-lethal dose. At one moment, I was lying next to a stranger on a stained mattress in an abandoned warehouse. Then came the initial rush of euphoric bliss, then nothing. Whoever I was traveling with at the time dumped me on the curb in front of an ER, making me someone else's problem. This was my rock-bottom moment, although at the time it felt more like freefall. I spent three weeks in a coma. I was aware of my surroundings and could hear the doctors and nurses as they checked my vitals and tend tended to my cleanliness and upkeep, but I couldn't move or speak. At the end of my third week in the ICU on an incubator, I looked up to find Mr. Brown Sticklegs hovering over me, his round, red eyes peering through the darkness. What have you done to yourself, child? His voice spoke inside my head. In my mind, I was beside him, standing in the middle of a vast, salt-flat desert. 
The ground was cracked and dry and a hexagonal pattern that stretched in all directions. This is your soul now. There is nothing left to drink. I heard my beep of my heart rate monitor back in my hospital room speed up as fear entered my mind. I called out to the dark ones, I said. I asked for them to come. They emptied me out. They emptied my soul. No, my child. You did this. You have not replenished. You have only consumed, and now nothing remains. I dropped to my knees in the middle of the salt as I felt a rumbling deep inside the hollow pit of my stomach. I leaned forward onto my arms, but they were no longer my arms. They were pitch black and empty. I could feel them, but when I looked at them, they were empty voids of smoke and shadow. I stood up on my legs, but they were no longer my legs. The darkness swirled up my torso, down my arms. The emptiness inside me consumed my entire body until only my head remained. What's happening to me? I heard a snap as my arms and legs split, forming eight black, spindly thin legs. I collapsed onto them, unable to support myself. Mr. Brown's dick legs glided down in front of my face, his eyes inches from my own. As I told you, child, only the Dark Ones have the ability to consume an entire ocean of a soul. That is your fate. That is what you will become. Back in the room, my heart rate monitor crashed to a flatline. I felt the cold darkness swirl up my neck to my head as the void consumed me. I was aware of the nurses and doctors huddled around my body, prepping the crash cart, but all I felt was the cold, consuming feeling of what was left of me. Help me, I uttered. Please. My physical body jolted from the electric paddles, but I felt nothing. Only the cold darkness. A needle injected it my IV line as they recharged for another burst of electricity. Still, I felt nothing. Only cold, only darkness, only the vast emptiness of the void. Mr. Brown Sticklegs tilted his head as he stared through his unblinking red eyes. He leaned forward, pressing his plate-like face to my forehead. I felt a vibration against my skin, followed by the tingling sensation of heat returning. The darkness receded back down my arms and legs. As he pulled back, the red in his eyes had diminished. A gift for the girl who gave me pants. A tear formed in my eye. It rolled down my cheek and fell onto the parched landscape below. Before I could say anything, an electronic jolt coursed through my body, pulling me away from the salt flat expanse and back to the hospital room. The, si the sinus rhythm of my heart rate monitor returned to normal. I felt the cool gel of the defibrillator paddles against my chest. I remember squeezing the hand of one of the attending nurses who smiled down at me. Look who's awake! I cried, but it was a different than before. I felt the pain I had long been avoiding, but I felt something else as well. I felt grateful and a sense of hope I hadn't known in a long time. It was a long road back from the darkness, but the thing about the road to recovery is that, like a road, it leads to destination. After years of listless drifting toward the void, I have a destination, and it was an important first step in finding self-love. I reconnected with my mother, who was struggling with her own form of darkness. We leaned on one another, talking and going to therapy as we worked through the issues that drove us apart. After my release from the hospital, I moved back home with her, her Facebook friend, long gone. I got my GED. I used my sketchbooks as a portfolio to get an apprenticeship at a tattoo parlor. I've been clean for four years now, and it feels good to smile again. Granted, I still prefer Pierce the Veil to anything from Katy Perry's catalog and my tattoos and jewelry have more skulls than fluffy bunnies. But that's all on the surface. I no longer crave the darkness to consume me. I often think about the vision with Mr. Brown's dick legs on the salt flats that night in the hospital. I had not seen him since that night, and I often wonder about the state of my soul since that day. Has it replenished, or has it still been dried up in barren wasteland that he took, to, took me to that night? Last night, around 3 in the morning, I finally got my answer. I woke up with a heaviness on my chest, arms and legs, 
At first, I felt the grips of fear grabbing hold, but like the first time I experienced it, but it, much like the first time I experienced it. But then in the dark corner of my room, I saw glowing red eyes staring back from the shadows. In spite of my sleep paralysis, couldn't help but smile when I heard his voice call out to me. And that's the tale of my sleep paralysis demon. I win. We will see you guys next week on Spirits and Ghost Stories.